Well, good morning. My name is Ashawn Nesbitt. I'm the CEO of the Florida Housing Coalition, and I'm very happy to be here uh, from Tallahassee. You all are talking about winter weather at 60 degrees. Uh, my wife sent me some photos this morning. It was 30 degrees this morning in Tallahassee, and a, a lovely sheet of ice covering the yard in the cars, so uh, this is a, a very balmy, early fall day uh, compared to, to South Florida, but it's great to be here. I'm from St. Petersburg, so I'm still getting used to the, the slightly colder weather in Tallahassee, uh, but it is really great to be here this morning to join for this Housing and Health Summit. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Florida Housing Coalition, uh, we're a statewide organization and uh, it was very interesting to see the slides that, uh, that Annie held up uh, with that, that big gap for those that are at the 50% AMI and below. And we know that that's the biggest need. And uh, we're happy about this panel because we have someone who is serving that need. And that is Stephanie Berman, who is the president and CEO of CAR4 Supportive Housing. And we heard earlier about kind of looking at where's, where's the money coming from and how, where can that money come through? And we have someone on this panel uh, who is representing that. That's Jim, <laughs> That's Jim Walker from uh, Florida Community Loan Fund, a, a, a statewide CDFI. And then we have a, a very non-traditional, uh, a group that you would not expect to be involved in, in housing, at least nationally. Typically, historic preservation organizations just aren't really involved in housing, but it's, it's, it's very unique to have that here. And so we have Chris Rupp, from, who is the executive director of the Dade Housing Heritage Trust. And this panel is about best practices and financial gaps in housing, healthy housing solutions. So hopefully we'll, we'll start to, to hear some of the, or see some examples of, of how uh, solutions are, are happening that are really starting to address the issue um, that can hopefully get some, some more ideas and spark some, some, some communication and some thought and maybe things that can scale up and, and really address this need. 100, over 130,000 units needed uh, for those at 50% area median and income and below. And so I'm really excited to get started. And so um, what we'll do is we'll have some, some short presentations and uh, Stephanie will start us out. And if you could just introduce us, yourself, I'm sorry, and go right into your presentation. Hello, everybody. I'm Stephanie Berman. I'm the president of CAR4 Supportive Housing. I do have a PowerPoint, but it is not advancing, so if someone can help us with that. Um, but I'll get started in the meantime. Um, CAR4 Supportive Housing is a not-for-profit, mission-driven developer. We serve folks primarily under 30% AMI, primarily coming out of vulnerable situations like homelessness, adults living with severe and persistent mental illness, um, the type of housing that we provide is called supportive housing, um, and I think most people don't really equate that with affordable housing and, and don't really know what that looks like. You know, they have images of supportive housing being group homes or ALFs or treatment centers, but supportive housing is a form of affordable housing. It's affordable housing for vulnerable populations with on-site supportive services. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, the model of supportive housing, which has been around for many decades, has really been on the forefront of the idea that housing and health live together and are important um, components um, to have an affordable housing. Oh, and here we are. But I still don't have a clicker. <laughs> um, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna skip most of this, which I just said. Um, this is just an example of some of the work that we've done. Um, we've built 23 supportive housing communities, mostly in, in Miami, but we're starting to do some work outside of Miami as well. And I just talked about what supportive housing is. And what I really wanna focus on is some examples of supportive housing that we've built in the community. Um, so that you can really get the feeling for what it is and, and really see that it is traditional affordable housing, but just with the on-site supportive services, with health and wellness services being a critical part of the services component. So Heritage Park at Crane Creek is not in Miami, but it's one of our newest developments that we built in Brevard County in the city of Melbourne, and it's an 108-unit um, affordable housing community. 
Um, it's the first in the state that mixes supportive housing, affordable housing, and market rate housing within one community. And on the ground floor, we have a federally qualified health center um, operated by the Brevard Health Alliance that is open to the community. So it's not just for the residents of the building, but it's open to anyone in the community that would like to come and, and have their health care needs met there. So Northside Common is one of our other developments, which is here in Miami. Um, it's 80 units also of supportive housing and affordable housing. So the only difference, I, I just designate those as differently because our funding sources designate them as different types of housing, but in, in, in essence, they're all the same. And we don't separate in our buildings which are supportive housing and which are affordable housing. All the units look the same and you know all the hallways look the same. When you walk by them, you don't know if you are living next to someone who's coming out of homelessness or someone with a severe and persistent mental illness or just someone who's in need of affordable housing. Um, what's wonderful about Northside is that it targets folks that have severe and persistent mental illness and downstairs we have the Key Clubhouse, which is, um, for those of you not familiar with the Clubhouse model, it's a behavioral health program for folks with severe and persistent mental illness um, that's centered on work recovery. So folks come to work every day at the, at the Key Clubhouse and they spend their day there working and receiving mental health, behavioral health services and then they can live upstairs in Northside. So we provide health services in all of our supportive housing communities in a variety of different ways. Um, we provide some of the services ourselves. We have service coordinators and, and clinical staff that's part of CARFOR, and we provide those services on site ourselves. And we also partner with um, other organizations that come on site and provide um, behavioral health and primary health care services. I saw Pauline from Betterway. They're one of our behavioral health care partners. They come on site and they provide recovery support services and other behavioral health services. Um, we have other partnerships, which I mentioned, with the Key Clubhouse and other primary health care providers. We also partner with um, the health department, who comes on site and does all sorts of health fairs. Um, during the pandemic, they came and did testing on site. We do vaccines on site. Um, we really try to focus on making sure that our residents stay physically healthy and that you know they stay emotionally and spiritually and mentally healthy. We know that it's very hard to retain your housing if you're not feeling good, right? So one of our primary focus is making sure that folks have the services they need in order to remain successfully housed with us. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Really just a, a fantastic model of what supportive housing looks like and has done well. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, we'll go over to, to Jim, who is going to, to talk about the money, the capital, and you know where, how that flows into to deals, and, and really share, you know, from the perspective of a CDFI. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Walker. I'm with the Florida Community Loan Fund. We are a CDFI. You've heard of um, that name mentioned a few times to, this morning. Um, been around since 1994. Um, I believe we're the largest um, CDFI in um, in Florida. I don't say that with um, a lot of pride I, other than to make the point that we are about a hundred million dollar uh, lending institution um, which just is dwarfed by the sheer volume of need so you know I, I I'm a guy on the ground trying to make a deal happen but I've been here 14 years the problem has only got worse um, so I, I'm very proud of the fact that we've done a fair number of, of projects and helped with nonprofits um, but I can tell you I share some of David's so sort of I don't know if it's ennui or just sheer anger at the, the level of the problem that we have. Um, I also wanted to point out, while Annie was putting up that slide, and I think the way Annie has sort of uh, described the challenge in, in the South and in and, and many parts of the, the country, uh, for that matter, um, I just did some back of the envelope in terms of how much subsidy we need to solve a problem like that, and I think with the, the close to 135,000 units that we need, um, it would only take about $50 billion of subsidy to solve the problem in Miami-Dade County. So given the number of uh, billionaires who are moving here, I literally think a 10% tax on the billionaires could this really totally solve it. Uh, so, and, and so to the, the other point, and David's comments were just so, uh, I thought, very powerful for me because um, this is not a problem of we don't know how to do this. We don't need 
many studies. The nonprofits here in the room that I work with across the state and across the country, they know how to build this, they know how to run them. All they need is money to do it. And whether we get the money through taking a haircut from the healthcare system or we ask the hospitality industry to help pay for um, supporting, there are lots of ways. But there's also one little way that we could do it. The federal government provides maybe one-tenth of the subsidy that it did 30 years ago. And so we've been going backwards on housing. And you can see it, it impacts people's lives. And for me, I just get really worked up by the fact that so few people seem to care when it comes to making policy changes that would impact our lives. But having said that, I want to get down in the weeds and just talk about a few projects that we actually have done that, that, that are successful and that we can be proud about. Um, just to, to give you a little um, uh, perspective, we do offer flexible financing. I mean, our goal is to provide capital. We don't provide a lots of the, the important subsidy that needs to go into projects, but we do try to provide flex, um, flexible loans that people can use. Um, if this were a problem that the banks could solve, if you, if you had a project that um, was attractive to the banks, we typically work in those areas where the banks don't find these attractive for whatever reason. They, um, we do take higher risks. Um, we try to um, have lower debt service coverages. We like to do other things that um, support making the gap that people have to raise less. Um, and you'll forgive me also because I'm used to looking at my slides and they're over there, so I can go this way and this way. So I'm going to take these off. Uh, uh, it's important to, to note as well, um, we do have, a, we are broadening the investors in our organization um, that, have, that really speaks to the interdisciplinary um, understanding that other organizations have in the value of housing as a way to affect social change. Um, we, we were started as a religious by, by, a, by a nun, and so we have in that kind of social impact that we, um, uh, we, we have experienced. But also, of course, long partners being financial institutions, I mean, they um, go out of their way, not only from the perspective of needing the CRA credit, which of course is a very important impact um, and a motivator for them to help us, but they also are very much, the CRA people and the banks are so dedicated to doing this, and so, so they, they invest in us so that we can invest in our communities. Um, we, you can also see that we do have some foundations, and, and, for, and over the last few years, I think the interest from the healthcare community in, in acknowledging the fact that housing is such an important um, vehicle for um, impacting their bottom lines as well. So we've, we've had a number of really important um, investors from the healthcare industry that have helped us a lot. And of course, government and individuals have been major um, as, as well. Um, what we do, we work in low-income communities. Um, in those low-income communities, we want to impact the people that need it most. Um, and we make, organization, we make loans to organizations, but not individuals. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, what I also wanted to say, we, we have never tracked this, but um, with the, the interest over the last few years um, getting such national attention, you know, we work in low-income communities, and of course, low-income communities typically correlate pretty highly with, with uh, people of color. Um, but we just wanted to have some more data around that. And so basically, this gives you a, just a little understanding of where our, where our dollars and our loans go into, and it is very, very highly um, concentrated into BIPOC communities. Um, and finally, here's just a little bit of, uh, of our impact to date. As you can see, we've provided about a little over half a, a, a billion dollars in financing um, in projects that total about 1.6 billion. Um, so it's, it's, it ain't nothing. Um, and we're very proud of that. As you can see, pro close to over 7,000 um, housing units and number of facilities. Um, so with that said, all we need is a, to up our game by an order of magnitude, and we can really start making an impact. Um, but I wanted to talk just a few minutes about some of the challenges that we see in all of our projects. Um, as you can um, see, project gaps result from the fact that if you want to buy or build, uh, you, 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 usually you can't borrow enough money or raise enough equity to do it because there needs to be a return. And so all of our projects that we do, there is a financial gap that is basically amount of subsidy that needs to come in to, to build or to buy and rehab. Um, but also, and Stephanie probably knows this more than anybody, there are lots of operating 
gaps if you are providing other kinds of services. Or if you're providing rents to homeless people or very low income, they can't, the, the, the um, revenue that you get from them can't even support the operating costs. So we have several. The third is a little one that I want to um, focus on in South, I think it's very relevant in South Florida. It's called, it, it, typically from a, fun, from a financial perspective, it's a sponsor gaps, meaning that a lot of the people that love doing this work or that are trying to break into this work don't necessarily have the experience or have a balance sheet that can help them um, be successful or that can allow them to go to typical sources of, of capital so that they can raise money. So we try very hard to address sponsor gap issues as well. So work with small nonprofits or, or non, even for profit small developers who want to make a difference. Um, so they may not have the expertise and I think Annie and, and the Miami Homes for All has been doing a great, great job, service to all of us in terms of trying to develop that community of, non, of small nonprofit developers or small developers who can gain experiences, who want to make an impact, but want to have a return as well. So we're, we're very much happy to be a part of that process as well. So how, how, what are the traditional sources then knowing that they can't, you can't solve all these um, financial uh, issues and so that you do have gaps. Well, there's the the, no, the normal ones that we see, everybody sees, whether you're going to the local CRA, whether you're going to the city, the county, the state, the federal government. I mean, those are the sources. There's, we, we can talk a lot about what makes them good, what makes them bad, what makes them inefficient. But, you know, I work with so many projects, they all have them. You bang, you bang, you bang until you get it done. Um, and, and so people can do it. And I think on the margins, yes, those can be more efficient. But the real issue here is, you know, Stephanie she could do 10 more projects if she got a lot more, uh, if she got a lot more subsidy. And so we, we can have that done. Um, the other sources, of course, are um, philanthropy. We, we've seen more and more um, uh, organizations that traditionally haven't been, uh, that are social service philanthropies um, that are now looking to invest in housing. That's really e exciting. Um, it's also culturally something that's new, so we're trying to work with that. Um, and of course, then the other the third um, area that I wanted to highlight is just other forms of subsidy. Um, typically, that might not be for the cash. They might be a city saying, um, you know, we're going to waive your impact fees or things like that. Um, um, and then the final one is where we come in, and it's just that one little bullet where um, how can you, you find capital that's really basically market capital, capital like whether it's from your bank or whether it's from an, an equity source or whether it's from um, someone like us, how do you try to use those, that market rate capital in a way that will allow you to need less subsidy from other sources so that you can leverage that subsidy um, more, uh, more highly? And so for that, perspective, I've just listed a couple that we try to focus on. Um, so again, so for example, um, how we try to make sure that the gaps, that the subsidy you receive is, is leveraged to the maximum and can be used in more projects or building larger projects, it's really to increase LTV. If, if, if it's typical that 70% LTV is something that uh, a bank would lend, you know, we try to go to 80 or 85. Um, um, if a coverage that's typically required for market capital is 120, we, we try to push it at 110 or 115. Um, and again, all these are just incremental changes that make, say, if your project needed $2 million in subsidy, maybe it only needs a million and a half at the end of the day if we can push these. Um, of course, keeping interest rates low, um, that's the one thing that certainly over the last year that's been hugely um, negatively impacting lots and lots of projects is, you know, our interest rates went up 200 basis points this last, this last year alone. Um, and so that makes projects, you know, really just tank. Um, so it's really hard. Um, and again, I just, uh, the, the issue of the intangible gaps, um, a lot of time projects make sense, but the sponsors just really don't have the wherewithal to make it happen. Um, and so we try to be as flexible as we can around that. Um, and I know I don't have a huge amount of time, but what I really want to do is, is spend um, a little bit of time on two direct forms of subsidy. As I said, we are typically a lender, but over the course of uh, maybe the last 10 years, there are two programs that I think are really valuable, um, at least that have helped us do our job um, more effectively. Uh, one of them, and this is a, our newest one that we've had access to, is the Capital Magnet Fund after, out of the U.S. Treasury, which, I, which has been a game changer for us. Um, because now we can come into projects not only with our sort of 
soft uh, market rate capital, but really highly subsidized capital. Um, the Capital Magnets Fund, is, it comes out um, every year um, by the U.S. Treasury, the CDFI fund. And I should mention that not only are CDFIs eligible, but um, nonprofit housing developers are eligible as well. Um, this round was about $320 million, a little over $320 million. There was one um, group, Ability Housing, out of Tallahassee. Is it Tallahassee or Jacksonville? Um, Jacksonville. Um, that won close to $4 million. And that comes as a direct subsidy. And the good thing about that is, well, Every subsidy, every source of subsidy is, is hugely oversubscribed, and you're always getting, um, you know, ten applications that are ten times the amount. Um, this is actually not that um, competitive. It's, it's, I think, this last time it was about three to one in terms of meaning people applied for almost a billion dollars of subsidy, but 320 was awarded. So your odds are actually pretty good if you're a nonprofit developer on on getting capital magnets funds. So we use that to add to our traditional lending products, um, and it's, it comes in as a soft second, maybe at 1% interest rate, potentially 30 years in maturity. So that really acts like almost like equity, almost like direct subsidy. So it's very, very positive. Um, the other, which I think most people probably have at least alluded to, um, have some information about or have seen, are the New Markets Tax Credits. We've been using those now for about um, close to 20 years, and the uh, challenge there is that, you know, really the New Marcus Tax Credits was built as this sort of community development uh, tool that looked sort of like the low-income housing tax credit but was to be used not for housing. But of course, people and good lawyers being uh, as they are, we've been able to do work it, to do housing in, slight, in a few different ways. Um, so having said that as background, I just wanted to walk you through a couple of the deals that we've um, been involved with so you can get a little bit of uh, understanding about how we've used those tools in, in those transactions. Um, this I just put in there so that you can just sort of try to uh, memorialize some of the, 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 the traditional um, lending guidelines that we use um, for our major, major sources of capital. Um, just one that's reasonably local, Hallandale Beach. This is our this is a, a traditional project for us. Um, this was a you know ten houses for sale, moderate income, um, eighty percent AMI. Um, you know that's the kind of thing that would be you know we would do every day. Um, they got a nice big subsidy from the, the CRA in Hallandale Beach, um, which basically brought the cost down from about. Three million, I mean, three hundred thousand a unit to about two thirty. So that really was a, a great. The 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 challenge there was that the city said, "Well, put that money in once you've built it and it's ready to be sold." So we we, we in that case we took our eighty percent loan and we said, "Okay, we we trust the city of Hallandale." Um, so we were able to provide a hundred percent financing for that developer to do that. Um, again, it's. Um, sort of more art, very traditional things that we've been doing, these single family houses, townhouses like that. Uh, this is a slightly different one, St. Stephen's Way, uh, an amazing project um, focused um, very much on um, low income, very low income renters, 50% AMI and, and lower. Um, these are units that are basically people at risk of facing homelessness, so they typically are people that uh, um, are at the lower end. Um, and we were able to provide a 80% financing there, but we had the capital magnets fund um, money that was available to us, so we were able to put in a million dollars of that CMF funds, and that's money that's at 1%, it sits there for 30 years, so it really bought down the sort of operating cost of the, to the organization. Um, and, you know, they were able to, they also had vouchers, so that certainly helped their cash flow. Um, but at the same time, um, having that source that it was, what made that a little more efficient is that they didn't have to go to the city and say, well, we need a, you, know, you, you to write us a million dollar check so that we can get all this funding together and move forward. We were able to do that so that they didn't have to sort of, you know, one of the things that all of these projects have um, in common is that there are three or four or five different sources of capital. And so just, it takes years to sort of put all that together. And so for us to have that tool in addition to our, our senior lending has been really exciting um, to be able to bring that in so that we could basically finance the whole thing. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about two um, new, mar new markets tax credit deals. Um, 
you know, the, the New Markets Tax Credit subsidy, for those of you who don't know, really brings about 20% of the total development costs in as subsidy. And in basically, it's sort of a very soft, forgivable loan. So it's, a, it's like a, a loan that comes in at 1% for seven years, and then it's forgiven. And that's sort of just because it needs to, um, we need to manage the sale of the tax credits to the investor. Um, I, and I wanted to have a health um, a healthcare um, organization represented. It's a local Jesse Trice Community Health sy um, System. It's a, it's a great, beautiful new facility um, that they built, um, and that used um, New Markets tax credits plus a loan from us. Um, not housing, of course, but it's actually right next to an elderly housing uh, facility that we, we financed as well. But again, New Markets' is direct subsidy comes in. That was about 20% of their project. Um, and 10%, so it was, you know, is a, a $2 million of, of money that they're not going to have to raise or pay back. Um, and then finally, this is, um, this is Lotus Village, which I don't know if you're you know, traveling up and down 95. This is a, a great, beautiful building um, that I believe is the largest women's home, homeless shelter in the country. Um, and it's got a, it's a, a hundred rooms. Uh, it was a thirty million dollar project, um, and new markets. And and the interesting thing is, everybody would think of this as housing. I mean, this is a women's shelter. People come in, they live there six months to a year, typically. Um, the great thing about these shelters is, um, I wouldn't say great thing, but the, the good thing from a new markets tax credit perspective is that um, even though it's housing, because you're basically not charging people rent for in shelters, um, it qualifies for new markets tax credit. So we have, I think, four shelters that we've um, f helped finance around the state. Um, and this is something that if you're building a shelter, come to us because we love doing this kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and really exciting, um, they are also building um, a children's education center right across the street from this. I mean, you, you, they come in, um, you know, this is, is 100 families here, so it's usually maybe 150 kids that are, in, that are at, at the shelter at any one time. Um, and so we're moving forward with a, a new markets tax credit um, investment in that, and that's just, just, that just broke ground this, this, last, uh, this last year or so. We're very excited about that one. The Lotus um, Village is a, about seven years old, so that's uh, um, very much a, a steady and um, you know, well-grounded well project. Um, really, that's all I wanted to say. I think it's much more interesting when we talk about questions, and, and I'm happy to answer it when we can. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> And we, we do know that uh, these, these projects are great, but so much of the housing is, is unsubsidized that folks live in. And so we're happy to hear from, from Chris, who was talking about some of the work that you all are doing around, around that. Okay, that's me, Chris Rupp, Executive Director of Dade Heritage Trust. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dade Heritage Trust, we're a 51-year-old historic preservation organization. And our mission is to preserve our community's architectural, environmental, and cultural heritage through education and advocacy. And coming here today, it just dawned on me um, the, the things that we're doing, how we fit into this whole message. You see the little, in our logo, the little building on the left. We're, our headquarters are in the original office of Dr. James Jackson, who Jackson Memorial Hospital was named after. We're, in Brickell, one of the one of the only historic buildings uh, existing in Brickell, but it's a charming office. I would invite you to come by and see us. Um, before I get into the housing, I just want to give you a, a little bit of information about our organization. We engage with Title I schools. We have a beautiful um, education program that introduces students to their community, and we take them all around Miami-Dade County and introduce them to historic places and green spaces um, and, and areas that they never really get to explore. Uh, our education program is really about introducing our community to residents and, and people that are that are new here and visiting because we think it's essential for our mission that people learn about where they live. We can't expect people to work for um, saving historic places unless they even know that they exist. We also do several community programs, bike tours, walking tours, even baking in historic places. Uh, we also do neighborhood surveys, which is documentation of historic areas uh, throughout Miami-Dade County. 
And what we've learned um, through our most recent surveys in Brownsville and Liberty City is really the history of the severe segregation policies in Miami that need to change, and housing is certainly um, part of that. Our advocacy programs, we're working now with uh, Miami Marine Stadium advocates, historic downtown Miami advocates, and so on, all, all in the interest of preserving these places that help tell the story of our community. But most recently, in fact, over the past three years, um, I think our organization is doing some of the most important work we've ever done. And this is preserving historic multi-residential buildings, primarily in Little Havana. Um, getting into uh, the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing was nothing I ever imagined, and it really happened serendipitously. Back in 2017, the National Trust for Historic Preservation deemed Little Havana a national treasure because of its rich immigration history and because of the incredible historic building stock. So working with the National Trust, we commissioned a study um, called um, Little Havana, Mi Importa, and we worked with a, a local planning firm to look at Little Havana in a holistic manner. How could we, how could historic preservation impact health and housing and historic preservation within that neighborhood? And so we took this study to our county commissioner, Commissioner Eileen Higgins, with an idea of preserving the affordable housing that exists. Um, I found out that affordable housing and housing in general has the most acronyms of any industry I've ever been involved in. So I started going to affordable housing um, meetings and worked with Healthy Little Havana that was working on housing issues in, in, um, in the neighborhood. And we came up with a proposal to our county commissioner to, to get some money from the county to do our first project to preserve a building in Little Havana that offered affordable housing, not subsidized affordable housing, but it was affordable because the living conditions in the building were so deplorable, as has been um, discussed before. Rats, roaches, mold, leaky roofs, leaky windows, and what you have is in Little Havana, a primarily immigrant, immigrant community, um, and and the, the tenants have absolutely zero sense of empowerment. So even if a landlord may have good intentions, nobody ever complains because they're afraid of being kicked out. And so the conditions just worsen and worsen over time. This was our first project, a beautiful 1935 Art Deco building um, on Southwest 5th Street. The, Photograph on the left is the way it looked when we purchased it, and this is the newly renovated building on the right. The average rent in this building is $950 a month. And um, we, the buildings, <laughs> I know, it's beautiful. And this program has created such a sense of pride within the tenants um, and a sense of understanding that they have a landlord that actually cares about them. And because it's obviously our intention to maintain these buildings to the best ability, right? To be a showcase for the neighborhood. And I'm gonna tell you, this building has had an impact on our intersection. The people across the street have painted their building, they've installed new windows, the people adjacent are re renovating their building, and so we see what this work does within this neighborhood. And it's, it's great work. We've purchased two more buildings um, with county funding. The county, uh, we had no idea after that first, um, that first contribution if they would be happy with our work. And because we're a very small nonprofit with a really knowledgeable board, we have proven to the county that we are excellent um, keepers of their cash. We are efficient. I, on our board, we have land use attorneys, preservation experts, um, uh, construction experts, and they all lend a great deal of pro bono work. So we're able to really efficiently um, rehab these buildings and we're, we're a good keeper of county money. The building on the left, um, when we were talking earlier about deplorable conditions and code enforcement. This building uh, is a 1926 central 
old Spanish central um, hallway walk up. Uh, there's another building in the back, so it features eight units. And the city of Miami deemed this an unsafe structure. So I can tell you that when I walked in and visited the apartments, I felt they were pretty secure, but code enforcement deemed it unsafe because the prior land, the prior owner did work without a permit. So they de deemed it unsafe. So we had to relocate the tenants um, from that building. And under the terms of our grant with the county, we, we can't just say, you got to go. So we found them new housing, and now we're having to subsidize that rent um, in a place that was much nicer than, than where, where they were living. So right now, we're going through the permitting process with the city of Miami. That building's going to need new plumbing, new electrical, new flooring, but it's, it's going to be a real gem um, when it's completed. And our most recent purchase is this very cool building on the right. We've, we've deemed it the keyhole building. Uh, it's a 1938 Art Deco, uh, four units in the front, two additional units in the back. And this, this building, I think, really speaks to what we do. These tenants were, this building was so neglected that on a daily basis I'm getting calls because they, they now realize that they have somebody who cares about them and that we're gonna ensure that they live in a healthy, lovely place. Um, a place where they can proudly raise their families and proudly say they reside in Little Havana. Thank you. Thank you, I just have a few questions and I wanna quickly pivot to the audience. Uh, so Stephanie, um, very beautiful, beautiful buildings that, that you, all, you all are building. A uh, couple of questions on that. Break down that, that cost. I mean, I'm a trainer by nature, so you know, when we, we train on the development process and we talk about, okay, first let's look at how much is this thing gonna cost. Then we say, you know, how much can we support in debt and then we kind of figure out what that gap is. So walk us through that process for, for one of your developments. So unfortunately, affordable housing is expensive to build, and that is a huge part of the problem. Um, you know, when we are looking for a new site and, and kind of visualizing a new development, we're competing with all the market developers out in Miami. So land is expensive, construction costs, as we all know, have increased significantly. Um, closing a tax credit transaction um, is incredibly expensive, just in legal fees and everything that goes into it, um, which is a pro it's part of the problem. So it's a really good question and something that I think as, as an industry we really need to tackle. Um, and then a lot of funding sources, um, understandably so, but they add additional features or you know they want green elements or require different things in the construction that make it even more expensive. So, it's a huge challenge to make affordable housing truly affordable to build, and that is especially true in Miami. Um, but I, I do want to also, you know, talking about the funding sources and how to put a deal like this together, um, and it's something that Jim alluded to. Um, affordable housing, you know, Annie and David both talked about all the capital that exists, and it's true. There, there is a lot of capital out there. Um, but when you're really looking at developing affordable housing for the, for the, the two columns that, that Annie mentioned um, when she was speaking, um, our deals don't look like traditional affordable housing deals, as Jim knows. <laughs> um, you know, our tenants don't pay the rents that traditional affordable housing tenants pay. Um, our typical um, tenant coming into supportive housing um, will pay 30% of whatever income they have as rent, and that's often in the $100 to $200 a month rent, which makes these deals very difficult to underwrite. And, and it's why we're so grateful to Jim <laughs> and other not-for-profit lenders like Enterprise or the National Equity Fund that really understand that the numbers on these deals are gonna look very different. But the only way to really build housing that's going to solve those first two columns on that graph are for lenders to think differently about what these deals look like. Going over to you, Jim. So I know you, you look at these things all the time. What are the, those biggest cost drivers in today's market that are kind of 
pushing things up and causing folks like Stephanie to now have 10 and 12 sources of capital. Well, they've, <clears throat> excuse me, they've always been complicated, of course. Um, I think the biggest, well, there are two big things that have happened in the course of, co since COVID. Um, the first being the construction costs, which literally I've, I, I had a project going into COVID, they, they were looking to raise about 200,000 per unit for subsidy. Right now, this still hasn't closed because it's the, the needed subsidy is $550,000 per unit. Um, these are some, I mean, and that's a huge example, but if you're trying to build well, if you're trying to build sustainably, if you're trying to build something that doesn't look like affordable housing, you know, they, these are the, even if it's $400,000 a, a unit, it's a lot more than it was. So that is huge. And the thing that's just hitting us right now, literally in the last few months, is insurance costs. I mean, my God, um, I have every borrower calling me and saying, my building had 40,000, my, my insurance last year was 40, and it's 150 this year. I mean, you ju they just won't, it just won't work. Um, I, that is what we are like in the middle. <laughs> so I, pe people will adjust to um, whatever. Um, and I think we have seen the pipeline reinvigorate, and thanks for Florida housing, you know, when, when the costs went up, they opened up a way to uh, try to provide more subsidy to projects that were in the pipeline to make that happen. Um, insurance is just going to hit the bottom line tremendously, so it's things right now that are in the pipeline that would underwrite are not underwriting anymore, um, literally just because of that. Um, and so two years from now, I'm going to be saying, wow, you have to pro forma your insurance at four times what you thought it was going to be before. Um, so again, those are the two huge things that uh, are driving it. Appreciate that, and, and hopefully some of these things at the state level, property tax exemptions can can start to 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 balance those things out. You know, not having to to wait for land use changes and things that of that nature. So, hopefully, you know, those can can address that. Uh, just one last question for for you, Chris. Is is really great to see um, housing happen. Um, really taking some of these smaller properties that exist in neighborhoods everywhere that need that and to be able to do it with very little subsidy or no subsidy at all. Um, and a lot of properties you work with have tenants already in them. What are some of the, the biggest challenges with that? Yeah, sure. So all of the properties that we purchase are fully occupied. So trying to rehab um, around and, and not displacing other than the one that we did is, is challenging. So it's a little more pricey because we've been able to, um, like, in the first building that we purchased, there was an empty unit. So we did, we rehabbed one unit at a time and moved the tenants around. Uh, we do uh, new roofs, new windows, um, new kitchens, new baths, plumbing upgrades, electrical upgrades. So I would say that the, the uh, tenants are very tentative at first because obviously when a new owner comes in, the first thing they think we're gonna do is kick them out, right? Um, and so it, it, there's a there's a big um, there's a big issue in building trust and and that we're there to do the right thing for them. So so far with three projects, I think everything is going pretty smoothly. Um, dealing with with tenants who have again no sense of empowerment um, and and have a fear. Um, is, is a challenge at first, but we're, we're showing them our true colors um, and letting them know that, that first and foremost, we're there to give them a better lifestyle. Thank you. And unfortunately, I think we are out of time, but I just want to just close off, say, you know, the, the infrastructure that's needed is, is on the stage. You, you have the developers, you have the financial institution that knows how to, to underwrite these deals. And, and then you have the, the, the trust here that's kind of working in, in filling those gaps in communities where, you know, not the big deals, but the small deals. So this is just, I think it's a, a small example of the infrastructure that exists already in the community. It just needs more investment. And so that's, that's, that's really what we need to drive in. We see there's no shortage of money out there. Um, just, just put your money with Jim. He knows how to, to, to talk to Stephanie and he knows how to get with, with Chris. I think that's what we need to see more of. So I just wanna thank all of our panelists. They will be here if you have questions for them after this. 
Um, but thank you all so very much. 